Okay. Uh, do we need to change that formally on the agenda? Okay. Okay. We have all the board members. All right. Okay. So I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the governing board. Um, let the record show all board members are present. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. And I need a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries 5-0. And since we are to the last meeting of 2018, I thought we'd uh, mix it up a little bit and let Dr. Finch give his report first. All right. I can hear the excitement already. Okay. Just obviously you saw the uh, choir speak. One of the one of our choirs, O'Connor Choir, uh, start us out. Uh, just a reminder of the holiday season, so it's time to go visit all of those schools. Every school has a some concert, some kind of a concert. Uh, this time of year, you can pick your pick your day and find a, a Deer Valley Unified School District concert somewhere. So this is the time of the year to do that. We also want to remind our students that you need to. Uh, when you hit the break here, get recharged, get uh, fired up for the second semester or on the other side of uh, Christmas break or holiday break. So I also, too, wanted to spend uh, 10 seconds just to thank Ms. Fisher for her years of service. I'm not allowed to give a speech, so I won't. But I just want to say thank you and pass it on to the next person. Okay. Um, Mrs. Ordway. So you went from one side to the other? Okay. All right. I'm going to make this short. Hmm. Anyway, so Kids at Hope was um, very inspiring uh, to listen to. Uh, so I'm hoping that we'll have some more opportunities to hear um, that message. Um, I've been to quite a few schools in the last couple of days. Um, it's working out because my sunrise and my sunsets are where my photographs are being taken and those are the ones that seem to be popular to be sold so I'm choosing to spend the daytime um, in our schools. Today I had an opportunity to uh, be at Bel Air and I brought uh, fourth grade Miss McCormick's class some reindeers, their little heads and they do a thing where they share about each other so they can understand where they come from and what we did today is we had new reindeer names with their new personalities what makes them um, beautiful what makes them annoying and all sorts of things so they had a really nice uh, writing and art lesson and it was really fun just to watch their little minds move and they make the best eyes anyway the rest of it I've been to the dance concerts um, choirs choir concerts there's just, it just reinforces the amazing things and talents that our students have and how our staff brings it out. So I am so thankful for this district and everyone that's in it. I hope you all have a very safe Christmas holiday break. And remember, there's a couple of days in between now and then. So keep your nose to the, to the grindstone. That's it. Thank you, Mrs. Ordway. Mrs. O'Brien. Thank you very much. Um, I had an opportunity to attend the Arizona Business and Education Coalition quarterly meeting, and they had a panel, um, Perspectives on Charter School Reform. But one of the comments that I wanted to bring back and, and share with all of you and, and our community is that the um, headmaster from the Tempe, Tempe Preparatory Academy, in response to some questions about additional accountability and transparency, his response was, please don't give us any more regulation because then we have to take money out of the classroom to hire people to, inf to do those regulations and enforce those things. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, hmm, funny. <laughs> the district public schools feel the same way. Please don't give us any unnecessary regulations so that we can put our money into the classroom where our students and our staff are. 
So I just thought that was a little ironic that in a time when um, they, we are looking a little bit more closely at charter schools and um, how they're operating and what they're doing, that that, that, that was his golden nugget to, to ask for us not to do that. And there were some legislate, legislators there, so he wasn't asking us, he was asking the legislators, but I thought that was a little humorous. Um, we also got to hear from Brian Mueller from GCU uh, um, about what they are doing again in their community, and they really have so many creative, out-of-the-box um, ideas going on where they're putting their students in their local s- uh, schools, the local public school district, to help those kids um, res- get academic achievements. So that was uh, awesome. Um, conversation with Kurt at Highland Lakes. In my... And I've been going longer than I've been a board member. I've never seen that many parents and staff members. Um, I, I think that was probably a record attendance, and it was a, some great conversation. So, yay, Highland Lakes. Uh, this week, well, maybe it was last week, teaching an Arizona documentary uh, out of Tucson was an excellent hour about that followed three teachers throughout the year. So if you haven't had a chance to check that out, I would. It's on Expect More Arizona. Um, I have a request uh, regarding policies. Um, we had some policies, a lot of policies on, on the agenda on September 11th. It appears that we have brought them all back except for three of them. Policy JL, J, which is student wellness or more commonly known as the recess bill. Policy JLCB-E, immunization of students and then JLCD Medicines and Administration of Medicines. I looked high and low, I just couldn't find those three, so if we could make sure that they get back on, on the agenda. And if, I've missed, if I missed it, if you could just point me where we voted, I would appreciate that. Yep. Um, and then finally, um, I'd also like to uh, thank Mrs. Fisher for her service to the Deer Valley District and community. And have everybody have a very happy holiday and winter break. Uh, Mrs. Fisher? You know, I've always hated board um, reports because it's personal glory in in most cases. Um, So I'm going to keep it really brief. Um, I will say that I have been um, really listening to a lot of individuals being attending a lot of LD meetings. Um, And our state is in a political war right now with uh, liberals and rhinos, according to some, um, uh, uh, affecting the, not only the uh, election, but removal of all conservatives from um, PC, state PC positions. Um, I would just um, like to be, I'd like to give a little bit of a cautionary um, word of advice, and that is, um, I do believe charters need to be they need to be looked at. We need to make sure money. We, but parents are also a way that they are now looking also at where money is being spent in public school districts. Um, rather than go to war with charters, work together and really, you know, have public education for once be about the kids. Um, there's a, a lot of people who are longtime friends in the same healthy that now um, won't speak to each other. And it's, it's really sad. It's, it shouldn't be over politics. And a lot of it is about kids. Um, so my hope for Deer Valley is that the kids are first. Because they should be. Um, and I would like to um, just wish Darcy and Jenny the best of luck and ask that, that you stick with a uh, student first, um, because you've been teachers. It's not that I'm just counting um, Ms. O'Brien and Ms. Orwell, but you've been teachers. And really stand for students. That's it for me. Thank you, Mrs. Fisher. Um, Ms. Tweedy. Last oh. Last week, I had a chance to sit down and meet with Senator Bartow, and she contacted me. Now that she's moving over to the House of Representatives, she'll be doing more work with education. So 
I felt really encouraged that she wanted to talk um, to people who worked in public education and to hear our perspective and our concerns. And I think being a teacher, a parent, and then a board member, I had some different perspectives. But I also, I do plan to reach out to more representatives and senators and see if I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about our conversation. One of the things I think that's difficult being on the board and as we approach budget season and, and setting our priorities and, and when we advocate for more funding, you'll always hear how much is enough. 52% of our budget goes to education. Um, how much is enough? How much does it cost to educate a child? And, and I've heard that in the past. And one of the things I brought up to Senator Barto, and she thought it was a good question, and I hope they pursue an answer. What does it mean to educate a child? Because you can't provide a dollar amount without defining that. And I don't think we're going to get anywhere in resolving our issues till that's defined. Specifically, when we talk about school safety and mental health, where does... Not that, obviously, school safety is important, mental health is important, but trying to figure out which part falls on our budget and which part falls on the mental health budget or law enforcement. Some cities provide resource officers and other cities don't. If it's our job to provide law enforcement and mental health for all of our students and that's encompassed in the definition of education, then education gets a lot more expensive. So. I think we also need to push for a, a, a definition and some, what is our role to fund in these areas and what is it their role to fund? And when we try to look at the ratio of psychologists and counselors, we definitely need to work all that out. So I mean, as we're being pushed to, do, to put a dollar amount on how much it costs to educate a child, I think we need to push back and say, you define what it means to educate a child. I mean, we can't come up with a dollar amount without understanding what that even means. And that definition keeps changing. So, Ms. Ms. Um, Senator Bartow did write that down and thought it was a good question and one worth pursuing. And I am going to bring that up because that's what I think makes it hard for us to set our budget priorities, is trying to figure out what is our responsibility to pay for. So, I'm hoping we can all push for answers there. Um, and that was that. And I did want to wish everybody happy holidays and enjoy your um, time off, restful time off. I'm going to use my time off to decorate my tree. It's just sitting there. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to also wish Miss Fisher luck and thank her for her service to Dear Valley. Okay. Thank you, Miss Tweedy. Um, so apparently, I had the least interesting week of everyone. Uh, sitting up here, so I will also wish Ms. Fisher best of luck in her future endeavors, and thank you very much for your service to Deer Valley and, and to the board. And that's it. For, oh, and happy holidays to everyone else as well. Um, and that's it for my least interesting board report. M and I can't call Dr. Finch because we already did him first. Ms. So. Frank, can I mention something? I, I think the red looks great. I'm on you, on you tonight. Uh, I think I need to find a new stylist, and that's all I'm going to say about that. I know uh, a really good one. Just saying. <laughs> Red and black is no, great. no thanks. <laughs> thanks, but no thanks, Doctor Finch. That's what I get. All right, so top that, Mr. Miglarino. <laughs> uh, pre <laughs> President Frank, members of the board, Doctor Finch, we have two reports to share with you this evening, um, and I, I'll I'll be brief. Uh, first, the student enrollment report through the 74th day of enrollment or the uh, end of November, um, still showing two-tenths of a percent increase over the same period of time uh, a year ago, about 65 students. Um, so that's good news, um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions regarding the enrollment report. Are there any questions for Mr. Miglarino? Uh, hearing none, I'll move on to the uh, uh, financials for November. Um, and the projected carry forward out of our m and is at $459,000. Um, and comparing that to a year ago, so year over year, we were at, at about the same dollar amount, about 451, so uh, in, in the same neighborhood. Um, but you may recall from last month, uh, uh, there was a considerable uh, difference between um, October of 2017 and October 2018. So uh, November was a good month for us uh, financially. 
and so we made up the the gap that existed uh, between the year-over-year -year, uh, data for for October. I uh, just want to also comment that, uh, as we mentioned in the uh, enrollment report, uh, we are actually up students, um, uh, or have an increased number of students, but uh, that's uh, as of the end of November. We get funded based on the 100th day of, of average daily membership, which that, th that date will be uh, about the third week of January, um, when that's actually can be at least initially calculated. Uh, we won't actually get a final number from the state until sometime in the summer, which is ironic since we have to build our budget well in advance of that, but that's a different story. Um, <clears throat> but my point being is that um, when we revise this year's budget, because it's based on current year funding, it will be, uh, there will be an increase to the budget line as well, which will increase the uh, projected carry forward. Uh, because uh, as you may recall, we built into this budget, uh, we were expecting a decline of about a half a percent of students. Um, and again, we don't have the final numbers to be able to tally this, but it looks like we'll beat that number considerably uh, and maybe even have a positive number. So that will reflect in our budget. And um, again, that will be part of what will be added into the May budget revision. Uh, so from a financial uh, standpoint, we had a good November. Uh, and with the enrollment numbers holding as long as they've had, um, I think that will also uh, bring a positive light to uh, the financial condition for us as we start to think about the 2019-20 plan. So we need all those students to come back after winter break is what you're saying? Uh, and bring Frank, some friends? Yeah, President Frank, okay. that, yeah, I even if they bring some friends, there's not enough, because it's an average daily membership, um, there's not really that much time. But uh, yeah, we do like for them to, to return. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, just putting it out there. Rest of the year off. Okay. All right. Um, any questions for Mr. McLevino? Okay. Thank you. So that brings us to public comments. Do we have any? And we have no public comments. So that moves us right along to item number five, old business. Um, Honeywell resolution, and I believe we need a motion for that. I move that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to approve the resolution to support reclassification of Honeywell tax assessment ratio for expansion per foreign trade zone provision. Second. Uh, President Frank, members of the board, uh, Dr. Finch, uh, as you may recall, the last board meeting we shared this at least preliminarily as a preview item. Um, and there were some questions that the, that the board had, uh, and just briefly for maybe those in the audience, um, Honeywell has asked uh, to take advantage of an opportunity that they qualify for, uh, for um, reclassifying any future development at their 19th Avenue campus, which is uh, just um, a stone's throw from where we're sitting today. Um, <clears throat> for any future development to be reclassified uh, in, instead of at 18% as it would be uh, under normal provisions, but at 5% under the foreign trade zone provision. Um, <clears throat> because there were some questions and unfortunately just weren't able to be with us at the last meeting, we do have representatives from the city of Phoenix uh, with us as well as from Honeywell and um, would like to have them approach the podium so that they can uh, share some additional information and answer some of your questions. Good evening, President Franks and members of the board. My name is Christine Mackey. I'm the Director of Community and Economic Development for the City of Phoenix. With me tonight, I do have Romina Kanak, I always say it wrong, so I'll apologize, Kananishu, who is with Honeywell, and our foreign trade zone expert that works on, on the team with me, Denise Giannis from the City of Phoenix. I would, uh, with your uh, permission, President, I'll answer the questions that you had last time, and then be happy to take any additional questions that you might have. One of the questions that was asked by this board was what would happen if Honeywell's 19th Avenue facility was demolished and a new building were built in its place? Would that entire building enjoy the same uh, benefits of the foreign trade zone that is approved through the state of Arizona? And the answer to that is to the level at which the building exists today, it would be replaced. So as an example, if the new building, that the building they demolished was 100,000 square feet, and they built a 200,000 square foot building, then the 100,000 square feet that you had already approved would still move forward with foreign trade zone status. The additional 100,000 square feet would have to come back before you for another concurrence letter and for your consideration at that time. Did that answer the question that you had?
Are there any further questions on this particular? Ms. O'Brien, I, I, I believe that was Ms. O'Brien's question. Just, okay, if I can go ahead. have a clarification. So they would be eligible to come back to ask for the additional 100000 to be, so that all 200000 could be under the foreign trade zone agreement? They would be. I'm going to look to my colleague just to double check, but that's correct, correct? I wanted to make sure I was going to answer you correctly. It's why I bring the experts who are smarter than we with me. Um, they would be allowed to ask, but has been our policy in the state of Arizona with the city of Phoenix and with the other taxing jurisdictions we work with. The existing facilities have not traditionally been approved to move to a foreign trade zone. The taxing jurisdictions are relying on that revenue and dependent mm -hmm. on that moving forward. And so it's not been the history in the state of Arizona that that additional 100,000 square feet the existing 100,000 square feet would not be approved for a foreign trade zone, only the new construction that the taxing jurisdictions aren't dependent on. So if we start with 100,000 square feet and then, as in your example, demolished everything and come back with 200, the, the original 100,000 still falls under the current property tax. President Frank's board member O'Brien, that is correct. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the second question, if there's no further clarification on that, the second question that we were asked was, um, if the if uh, the Honeywell ceases to exist, heaven forbid, I'm the economic developer, I'd be in big trouble if they did. If they cease to exist at that location, the foreign trade zone is it grandfathered in to the next company that would come in. The answer to that is no. It is very specific to Honeywell and Honeywell's application. And so anyone coming to that facility in the future other than Honeywell, would be required to start through the federal, federal foreign trade zone process again and would be required to gain uh, concurrence letters from all taxing jurisdictions, again, for anything new that they would be adding to that facility. Okay, thank you. Are there further questions from the board? Mrs. Fisher, did you have um, any questions? Okay. Thank you. Is there any discussion the board would like to have prior to calling for the vote on this item? I would be curious to hear what your thoughts are on this. I'm, I'm not real sure about this one, but what you guys are thinking. Are you thinking this is good? Go ahead. You can go first. Go ahead. So after the meeting um, two weeks ago, I did uh, was concerned. So I, I did um, talk to um, Ms. Denise Yanez from the city's office and had a very lovely conversation with her. And um, I think she cleared up enough of the points that I was concerned about, especially the, the property tax related to the current building size. Um, and certainly, we can't control, I mean, Honeywell could choose to leave there whether or not we do this or not. I, I would be curious, or I guess I thought we would get to hear a little bit from um, the person from Honeywell to tell us a little bit about what, what they're looking at and what that could mean economically to us. So if you want to hear from her first before maybe we as a board discuss it some more, sure. if that would be okay? Yeah, so we'd be um, interested in any information you have to share with us. Absolutely. My name is Romina Cananisho. I'm Vice President of Government Relations for Honeywell. I'm based here at the Aerospace Headquarters at Sky Harbor. Um, I would, we have about, in the Valley, I would say 7, 000, seven between seven and 8,000 employees. Um, and there's about 2,100 to 2,200 here at the Deer Valley facility. Um, the Deer Valley facility is actually a very important site to Honeywell, um, especially in the aerospace business. We're going through what we sort of like to call rooftop consolidation across the world. All of our sites are being looked at for potential either growth or closure, uh, depending on what business lines they have, depending on what the future of that business line is. and. Um, if there are uh, business lines that are similar to theirs where they could be joined together. Um, and the Deer Valley facility actually is one of the sites that has the potential to receive more in, um, employees depending on what happens in other sites. And the reason for that is because we have a pretty extensive 
um, workforce here. We have an extensive engineering workforce here. Um, the state of Arizona is a wonderful place to do business. Honeywell's very happy here. And so we work very closely with the city of Phoenix to identify opportunities for us to bring employees when necessary. And we have a lot of square footage here. So when you have space and you have a, a, a welcoming uh, environment and a welcoming community and you have a strong workforce and the school systems are good, people tend to look at that and our leadership tends to look at that as opportunities for uh, investment as well as opportunities to continue to bring employees if other sites are not as performing as well as they should. Uh, we recently did do an announcement of a closure of Albuquerque site. Those employees, there's about 1,100 employees there. There is potential for some of those jobs to come here. They haven't made a decision as to where those jobs are going to go. But being that Arizona is really close to Albuquerque and it is the aerospace business and there is a lot of synergy between the work that was done here to what can be done here or there and here, uh, there is absolutely a potential for some of those employees to come here. And so the goal here is to get these sites ready in Arizona as much as we possibly can for further investment. And if that means that, you know, investing in these sites and constructing them or changing the layout of the site, for instance, in today's, if you go into the Deer Valley site, it's an older layout. Uh, there's some potential for changing of the layout to be more of an open frame, um, modernizing the facilities. Those investment costs, if we can get a lower tax benefit, a tax rate by them, we put more thought into where we're going to be investing in modernizing sites. So these are the decisions that are sort of brought to us and what drives those decisions and what are those costs going to be for Honeywell when we make those decisions as to where we're going to put employees and where we're going to invest future capital dollars. I have a question. Mrs. Ordway. What, what is the timeline? Do you guys have a timeline for this? For which? for your um, moving about and figuring out where you're? Uh, well, it's ongoing. Um, so, you know, we've got 30, 40, 50 sites throughout the U.S. that are just mm -hmm. in aerospace. And it's an, it's an ongoing process. There is no sort of one timeline. The Albuquerque site uh, itself was just announced two weeks ago, I want to say. And I think there's a two or three year timeline total to decide where those people where those jobs are going to go and, and and how that's going to transition out okay thank you other questions from board members mrs o'brien have um at the time i received this email from Ms. Yanez, there were two other tax jurisdictions that had not yet approved um your request has that changed you no, we're still working with both those taxing jurisdictions. You are, mm -hmm. okay. So they're still working with Phoenix Union High School and Wilson Elementary as well. Mrs. Fisher? I don't have questions, but if you want my input, it basically comes down to uh, this would allow you to set up a environment in which you will most likely retain a large organization serves the community um, and draws population into um, the community with a larger growth. Um, having gone through a couple of corporate takeovers, it, and I'm not saying this is uh, in no way so form, um, but, but in corporate things are very different and, and things change on a time. So in my opinion, you want to make your environment the best for them, um, not to the point where you're giving away the whole kit and caboodle, but you want to make it attractive um, because they have a bottom line, unlike a tax base, I mean, mm -hmm. unlike tax dollars that just come in. They have to be profitable. They have to be um, able to run. So in my opinion, it, none of the numbers that I looked at with the information that Mr. Mulino sent to us looked out of norm for the corporate um, tax rate. It looked like it was a, a pretty good deal as far as, I mean, it's, it's, it's I don't want to say a crapshoot, but it kind of is. You, you give them the tax credit, they go, they, they stay. Um, if it's not an attractor, you don't have the additional kids, so your tax, or you don't have the, the revenue. Um, but the probability of that happening is, is them leaving, um, I guarantee you, would cause a, a movement in populations. Um, and it may be a, a movement, and 
and you may not lose your senior citizens or your, or your older you know, people like me whose kids are, my God, my daughter can do one to me. Um, but anyways, people like me whose kids are, are, are grown or almost grown, but someone who's a young family and they are, you know, they just may move to wherever Honeywell is if they are not yet vested in their retirement plans or they are just at that right. Um, so I just think it's beneficial for the district most likely overall. The one concern that Ms. O'Brien had was a valid one that whether or not, you know, can they turn that tear down the facility and put them in one of the changes. And that's a good concern. My opinion, a financial growth prospect, I think. I think it's a well, and and uh, the facility at Deer Valley is not the only um, Honeywell facility within our district's boundaries. You also have the a facility at 59th Avenue in Union Hills. That's not part of the foreign trade zone. The Glendale facility? Right, right. Yeah. But I'm just saying in terms of, of, the, of your company overall, that you have more than one facility within our district's boundaries, and that does bring in um, families and, uh, and children. Um, so and good paying jobs and you know all of those things so miss tweedy okay that was my instinct too but i i just wanted to make sure there wasn't something that was missing. okay thank um, you does the board need further discussion or shall i call for the vote it, it sounds like we're ready to vote mm -hmm. okay all right so all those in you favor aye. aye aye any opposed during the discussion, my comp my um, tablet went to sleep, so I've got to wake it back up. Yeah. Okay, motion carries 5-0, and I would like to thank you for coming to our meeting, providing answers and some clarification for us. So we are are pleased to approve this um, this request. Okay, consent agenda. Can I get a motion? I move that the governing board approve consent agenda items A through F. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hmm. All abstain. Okay. So it sounds like four ayes, one abstention. And the motion carries. Okay. Our first action item is the payroll voucher. I move that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to approve payroll voucher 11 in the amount of $8,307,793.96 and expense vouchers on the voucher summary sheet in the amount of $2,234,863.54. For fiscal year 2018-19. Second. Um, any questions or discussion on this item? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. Any opposed? So we have one abstention. Is it four ayes? Okay. So the motion carries. Um, action item 7B, approve the addenda pre-approvals. I move. I move that the governing board accept the administration's recommendation to pre-approve the agenda as presented. Second. Um, are there any questions or discussion regarding this item? No? All right. I will call for the vote. Wait. Ms. Tweedy, did you have a question? Is the um, Title I parent liaison, is that an agenda for all Title I schools? Does, does, does that position exist, or is it just for one school specifically? President Frank, Ms. Tweedy, let me look into that information. Um, I am not certain that there is one at each Title I campus. In fact, I do not believe there is. But we'll get that information and put it in this week's update. So then my concern would be, and, and, and it won't stop me from voting, if somebody at another school is doing those same responsibilities, that they also be compensated. That was kind of my issue with it. So, so whatever that, unless it's something unique to one campus, then I think if anybody <coughs> at other Title I schools has to do that, they should also be compensated the same. So just to ensure equity across all campuses. Yeah. 
President Frank Miss Tweedy, that we will make sure that occurs. Sometimes through the needs assessment for our Title I schools, one school might identify that this is a need and, and that's how the funds are expended there and the other schools have not identified it as a need through the needs assessment, but we'll make sure that we come back with you with that information. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Galligan. Um, any further questions? Then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Four ayes, one nay. The motion carries. And action item 7C, appro approve employee travel. I, I move that the governing board approve all employee out-of-state travel per governing board policy GCCE. Second. Is the, are there any questions or discussion on this item? Okay, hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 In, any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Um, uh, Mrs. Fisher? Between the screens. Okay. She voted aye. All right. All right. So our um, discussion item for tonight, our one and only discussion item for tonight, so we can make this as, as long a meeting or as short a meeting as we want, no pressure, is the employee, much anticipated, long awaited employee travel plan. Sure. Dr. Finch. Um, I, I was looking for, uh, for direct feedback on this, and so I didn't really get much, but I, so we kind of went off of uh, how we do uh, AMGs, because I, I promised that I would kind of go that route. Uh, we ran the numbers from last year, um, and we talked about that last, the last uh, time we were together. But this, uh, so I'm putting a writing writing as a draft. I want to thank um, Ms. Taylor for obviously um, putting the magic words to it. But I, um, in general, the the structure of the AMG is a little bit of philosophy, um, uh, some procedures that tie it into current um, current things that we do. Uh, for example, the district travel travel tool, etc. And then the um, the third part is more. Um, what I call the unintended consequences, so a just-in-case clause. And so, because um, as you know, anytime we do anything, you know, we there are often pieces that we forget or uh, that show up later. So uh, I that's kind of the layout of it, and I'm open to any corrections or thoughts or directional change. I'm not married to it, but uh, this is kind of what I started with, uh, an AMG and then the budget from last year. Uh, keeping it in proportion to our neighbors, uh, the district average, if you remember last time we discussed this, uh, our competitive friends are about the, in around 900,000, and we're currently at 650 after two years of reduction, and so uh, we froze that number there, and so we kind of went off of that and divided off of really what was happening last year. Again, probably the, the most important line in this whole document is um, the line about the superintendent um, being able to um, kind of mo monitor this and and uh, do the exceptions if there happens to be a snag. So that's the general philosophy of the AMG. Um, again, if you want me to add some other parts or takeaway parts, that would work. Okay, thank you, Dr. Finch. Um, I'll open it up to my fellow board members for comments, discussion. Ms. Tweedy? Question. And since I didn't get it till last night, so I couldn't really answer question or forward sure. my questions, I was at work all day. Um, when you came up with the number we spent in the previous year and this year, did that include the school travel or exclude the school travel, the 600000 and the 800000 Maybe what I'll do is I'll pass the ball to Mr. Miglarino because he um, would know a little more of the details of how the budget was formed. Yeah, President Frank, Ms. Tweedy uh, included all travel. So a any travel regardless of where it was funded from, um, or how it was originated. It, and just as a reminder, it also includes travel for our itinerant staff that have to travel from one school to another because it, it would be uh, a difficult task for us to be able to pull that data out of the, um, out of the totals. Well, now, if, and it may be that I'm not. I, I, I got it last night and I looked at it quickly. Isn't this budget excluding the school travel? 
Um, no, it's my understanding that this was all travel for the district. So this is a district budget that we're establishing. What do you mean when you when you're saying school travel? The, the in the. It includes. I thought I saw something on there that said. It's that would be in the philosophy paragraph talking about the different types of travel, uh, like title, um, school. I think I talk a little bit about that. Because I thought at one point I saw something that said it excluded school-based travel coming from their funds and grants, and it was lumped together. No, that was just a more of a ph philosophical statement. So I think it's uh, Mr. M is correct that it's all. Well, basically, the numbers we're looking at. So it's it's, it's actually a million dollars in travel and conferences combined, correct? So it's the six fifty plus the four hundred thousand. Am I reading that correctly? Uh, President Frank. Um, Ms. Fisher, no, it's six fifty combined. Oh, okay. oh, it's four hundred and two fifty for a grand total of six fifty. Okay. And I think what Ms. Tweedy is reading from the second bullet on the ANG under the uh, under the he heading of exception reads: travel requests using funding from MNO school-based funds, community ed trainings regarding leadership development, training of trainers, staff development, individual growth, campus or district initiatives, and projects that encompass the DVUSD strategic plan. Okay, I, I see where she's looking. Um, just, just uh, by policy, the only thing the board really approves as far as travel is out of state travel, um, and because of that, it, I really. Um, just wanna, you know, I guess, it's, it's, it's different when you're um, travel uh, for something that's that's local or between schools, or if they're sent to some points here, is it going to come before the board anyway? So it needs to be discretionary um, to the extent that the only thing by policy that comes before the board is out of state travel, um, and I think we established that, that was the equivalent of 50 miles out of state. So, just kind of cautionary in that budget is that even though it's 650, is what we're looking at here, um, may not be what you necessarily see because, like, you know, the Glasgow and the spring conferences are off on every day. But it's actually listed, I think, in across the river, uh, Kingman, whatever's right there. Um, so, that would that technically would never come before the Tucson would never come before the board. Um, if, if our teachers and staff have to travel to Tucson or Sierra Vista, those would never come before the board. So it's going to be really difficult to break it all apart. Um, so the, the 650 is kind of a one time of the 650. How the state at the school. Yep. That was our budget for last year. But so we're going off of that. Dollar or dollar mark that we spent last year. That's what you're agreeing. Yeah. So it's not okay, so there's nothing on top of the six Correct. Correct. Other and than I, make sure we're interpreting this, this Yeah, way. and uh, Ms. Fisher's on the right trail. This we the whole reason why we're doing this is for the guidelines or a message maybe to on how we're going to how we're going to handle travel and make sure that it's monitored better. That's kind of the request that you're asking. So that's kind of the premise behind an AMG. Again, remember that's an administrative guideline within the system. Uh, Ms. Fisher's correct, it's the budget that you, the number is really what you're technically responsible for. Um, and then the oversight of me, obviously, as I monitor the, the system. So that's kind of so, so what I'm saying is between us and you, no one's yeah, going correct. to prove anything in excess of 650. Correct. We're not going over. Correct. Because my premise of a budget is that's what we're living with. Right. right. But, I, I, but what that line means is unless. And it's not that unless you're not going to give It's not that you're going to just give them more than 650 The budget is 650 Right. But if they receive a grant and that grant says X amount goes to a training for X amount of teachers in this location, that money there is not part of that 650 That grant. Not, not, part if of, it's, not if it's... Right, or, or whatever. In other words, if there is a specific additional situation, because it could be a grant, it could be a, a scholarship, it could be an employee who's just serving on a committee for something, 
and they're paying that. It's not. It's not going to be part of that. I'm it's saying the district's not the going to pay over six fifty. Right. That's the premise of a budget. Right. Um, my, what I want to make sure too is that um, that we don't. I want to be in relationship, and I think I put this in my um, Friday update a couple times. Ten years from now, I'm not going to be spending six fifty. Obviously, inflation goes up, fuel goes up, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, in, and I put it in my, again, my Thursday update, I want to keep in relationship to the average of my peers. If we're 20% less than our peers, I want to continue to keep 20% less than our peers until the board makes another decision that's different than that. But um, that's what we were, that's what we are now, whatever the difference from 900 to 650 was. Because that's the average of our peers. Well, I, I just want to make sure that when we are setting a budget, for the travel, that the guidelines that we have are not going to preclude um, opportunities that may come up that are not grant funded, but that come up, you know, once in a whatever right. kind of thing. So I don't want to uh, have the language be so um, tight that, that if there was an opportunity um, that we couldn't unless it's something that you would have to bring before the board as a separate item. I, I because I, I do want to make sure that we're honoring and valuing the expertise of you and all of those that are working with you to make sure that we're not um, cutting off any opportunities to serve our staff and students. I, I think the the phrase or the wording, unless otherwise supervi approved by the superintendent, mm -hmm. gives the superintendent that latitude. Um, to make some decisions and some flexibility within the funds. And, you know, as far as, as conferences, um, there are very few, well, I don't know of any conferences that aren't announced and planned several years in advance. Most large organizations, if you're looking at um, a mathematics association or uh, National Science Teachers Association or any of those, they generally have their conferences planned out Five right, but when, years in advance, what I'm so. referring to is not just a conference. I'm referring to there is an opportunity for someone to right. go, and I want to make sure that we have that ability to do that. Right, and I think that's covered in the wording here um, with the approval of the superintendent. Right. I, I just wanted to be brought out so we have okay. clear-cut communication and transparency when we're doing this. So in the end, the board puts the check mark by the by the budget. So. Um, We'll, as we've shown, we, we reduced it the last two years, and I think that's a solid number there, 650. And so we'll stick to that number until the board thinks otherwise. If we are missing opportunities, then I'll be coming back to the board and say that right. number well, doesn't work for X, well, Y, or Z. And, and we did reduce it to 650, but it's still an arbitrary number that we it's, just pulled out and started is. to use as a, as a base number. So I'm just saying that we have that base number, but I don't want to be so tied to it that we um, miss opportunities. Yep. I think I discussed this earlier too and kind of mentioned how, uh, again, given the superintendent some latitude, I'd like to see more horse trading in our uh, cabinet, um, planning out kind of where Ms. Frank is going. Um, if there's a, a, uh, something happening three years from now and, and a staff member or a division wants to send some staff to that, then they can horse trade within the cabinet. Um, can I borrow 40 from you this year and you give it back next year? so I can move X, Y, or Z staff three years from now at this special conference. So that's kind of the whole reason behind the superintendent clause there. Good point, though. And I think that sounds fiscally responsible. Um, yep. Planning. Oh, absolutely. Yep. Stuff does happen, though, so that's why we added it. So well, not everybody needs shoes at yep. the same time, so I like yep. that thought process. Okay. We'll see how this works, and we'll come back to you if it doesn't work. <laughs> but we'll, uh, we'll stick to that number. Questions, Mrs. O'Brien? Did you? I did have a clarification from Mrs. Tweedy um, because she said money spent by the district but I w wanted to make sure that, that this exception clause that talks about the title title funding and grants and CTE money um, that that there was a clear understanding of those funds being part of the exception the, uh, um, Mr. M is going to have to help me out here, but I believe that is all, um, all including all. So, um, for example, if, if uh, a CTE conference comes up and the CTE folks are out of travel dollars in their budget, then they're going to have to come to me or to um, another cabinet member to, to uh, borrow some money to uh, get them to this conference until 
and maybe trade next year. I don't know. Correct here, Mr. M. Um, <coughs> President Frank uh, and Ms. Uh, O'Brien, the yeah that that is what we envisioned is that we would set the budget at 650, and uh, there could be some um, quote unquote horse trading uh, within the different uh, departments that you see ident identified there, um, but we would set a hard limit at 650 um, pending any other uh, input from the superintendent per the AMG. Okay, then I have, a, I guess, a question for clarification for me then. If it, in a department receive our number's a hard 650, a department receives a grant for, six, for whatever dollar amount that includes them traveling to some conference out of state, that has to get your approval? It does. As well? It does. It gets yours as well because it's out of state, but it is often writ in, written in the grant, and so it would have to be taken from the 650 number. So if we wanted to send all of CTE teachers and it took 650, then guess what? And then nobody else is going to travel that year, exaggerating the point. But so I don't know if that makes sense. It, when you write a grant, often uh, PD is included, and sometimes PD is uh, out of state. But the grant includes that as part of the grant. Correct. So but it, from my opinion, the, the message that I got from the board was we only want to spend this much on travel, period. And I guess that's what that's the clarification I'm asking for from okay. Ms. Tweedy at this point, is that if our budget for conferences and training is 650 and a, and a staff member department, however you look at that, gets additional grant funding that would take us above the 650, are you saying that that wouldn't be acceptable? Not if, if it's funded by someone else, then I don't think that it would have to be in the six if we're not paying for it. I, my problem with not having a travel budget is every year we're telling, we're saying no to people. So, I mean, I think we need to show where we're setting budgets and reducing in other areas. But if, if you wrote a grant, and so I, I, I can't even think of who, but, but yeah, there's like, so like a math grant and they were going to fund your trip to a math conference and it's not in any way impacting the district's budget then i don't think that i'm just asking for additional clarification I would, see, that's because why I that was a little bit confused with the language there yeah. i think that's an exception from the 650 but i don't think that if it's coming out of the district's funds i don't think it should be excluded from the 650. It's okay, that's money kind of different than I was. I thought the message that I was given. Well, so the, actually, the real dollars, quote unquote, and again, I'm a totally guess here. But let's say it's two hundred thousand of M and O, and the rest is grants and title and et cetera, et cetera. I'm not considering title a grant. I, I, I mean, a grant like it, like they're paid for by someone else. They're, let's they're say paying that. for a specific yeah, trip. Because title no. funds could go yeah. to student intervention. Let's say it's two hundred or two hundred fifty thousand. That the rest of that is probably grant driven or part of your the package that comes with your division or with your um, the objective that you're you're writing for your grant. So I'm going to pass the ball to Mr. M. If, if that is correct, or because we had this exact same discussion in executive cabinet on what does this number really mean, I got the notion from the board that all means all, and so that was anything that had a T in front of it for travel was under the 650 and Mr. Uh, Migorino and, and the executive cabinet talked about um, this concept. I actually don't mind this, but I think we need a new definition then, but maybe Mr. M, you could fill us in. Yeah, President Frank, um, members of the board, Dr. Finch. So uh, the document that's labeled uh, travel comparison actually has the m and amount broken out. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would be just at $200,000, uh, so 120,000 in conference and about 80,000 in travel uh, for fiscal year 18. Uh, it's when we add in all the other funds, which would include grants, um, that would uh, grow that 200000 to 650000 So we could set the hard limit uh, and change the, MG, the AMG to say that M&O would be restricted to $200,000 combined. Well, Ms. Tweedy makes a valid point, though. It's not just M&O, because Title I funds are not, that's not a grant. It's not the same thing as if somebody writes a math grant or a Right, but they're not our resources. Right, a it's not right. For, title one for somebody funds it, right. or Title two even, right. because Title two you could use to fund like PLC stuff. Correct, there. correct. Title four. Yeah. And so could, that, that could Jim we, finish what he was saying, and then I, I, I think you're on the right trail. Um, any other clarification? Um, 
I, I think I heard somebody say that Title I is not a grant. It, it is a grant. It's an entitlement grant, but it, it is a grant. <clears throat> so, I'm just saying that's not what she's referencing when it comes to grants. And then I guess we just need a definition because we have this by fund number, so we can we we can pull whatever data you guys would like to see. What what I'm trying to say is I think if it's a grant specific to a trip, like you 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 literally write a grant to go to a conference, right. a Title One or Title Two money can be used in other areas. So it, it it I don't think that should be excluded from the 650. That um, those kinds of numbers are probably hard to get. I don't know if Jim can break them out that way. Um, then just include everything in the 650 like we were, if that makes it easier. I was just saying if a teacher or a, a somebody... I like your other idea. I, well, <laughs> it's I, less work for me. Somebody, it's, it's really about M&O. If the, really the bottom line is about M&O. No, it's not just about M&O. Because okay. you could be hiring reading specialists with Title I money, even though it's technically called a grant. But that's a little different than somebody, even like Title II funding. And, and you could actually use all this money probably to fund PLCs here that you were saying you couldn't. But I'm saying um, if somebody wrote and, and they were going to get sent somewhere, say by ASU was paying for something. I'm just throwing things out there. And it was specific to a trip. I wouldn't want that to have to count against your 650. Okay. If it makes an accounting nightmare and you want it to count against the 650, I would not want to exclude Title I and Title II funds from the 650 budget. I, I guess maybe then I'm asking what would be the exception. So do you want me to put the exception in there of any grant-specific travel that is paid for by an outside institution or something along that line? Oh, by the same token, the other examples, if someone is an officer in a national organization or a national organization uh, pays all of their expenses to go to a conference, that should not, count in my it. opinion, count okay. against the budget because that's an outside organization. And those money that gave money specifically, it can't okay. be spent on anything else. Okay. So th those, are, that, those are my thoughts. Mrs. O'Brien, did you think you had something you wanted to share as well? Okay. I just didn't want to. Well, th this is a draft, so I can bring it back again next round and sure. kind of get you uh, updated. And we might be able to find find some data on, on grants that are paid for by other folks. So um, I don't know. We'll see what we can find. The I'll, I'll bring it back. The only thing I would want to say, because I know you want to grow as your neighbors grow, you may not have the same grants or the same thing your neighbor has. Yeah, um, pretty much. But know, again, it's my, average of our of our five peers, so not yeah, just a, the that, anomaly. I mean, it's just that my, my neighbor across the street has the world's best wood shop with the top of the line lathe and table saws and everything. I gotta else. go visit him. And I have <laughs> you know, the cheap stuff. I'd love to have his, but I don't have that right. kind of revenue. But the average um, of your five neighbors, you're probably close. Because your other neighbor doesn't do anything. I'm just saying I would be cautionary. <laughs> no, I hear you. Don't, don't just because you see someone else spending a large amount of money. Yep. But it's it benefit kids yep. versus sure. um, just compensation. Yeah, hence the reason why I went with the average for the anomalies. Good point, though. Correct. Okay. Um, any further discussion on this item? All right. Uh, anything else we could just email, right? Okay, so future meetings and dates are posted. This is our last meeting of 2018. So if there's nothing further, um, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Didn't think so. Happy right. holidays. Meeting is adjourned at 8.03. I think this record. is a new record. I think it was early 8.02. Uh, 8.03. New record. All right. You're welcome. <laughs>